Oh, well, there's... Actually, I think this might just be the end of the hangar deck because it seems like yeah. there's still bow structure down there. And uh, that might be like a windlass. Or, no, there's two bits there. Or two windlasses. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think it just drops down a deck. I yeah. think yeah. that you are at the end of the hangar deck. Yeah, I think, no, I I think it is the bow still there. Right Hopefully it's still intact. Yeah, windlasses. All will be you see some anchor chain there. Yeah. Oh, yeah, leaving off to the right. Yeah, just, there's anchor yeah, chain. I, yeah, not I think it's down there. Yeah, two of them. Is the bow kind of like flush with the with the sediment? Might be. Are we able to look we're down? We're at the bow, Mike. Mike, we're at the bow. No, I I know. I'm just asking if it's flush with the sediment. Just about. Maybe a little dig into there. It's tough because I'm still right over the hangar deck here. Yeah. Okay. No. We yeah. We'll, we can move a little further if we can move a little bit backward, like not backwards, but like off while we move right. Yeah. We think do 10 meters at 320. Yeah. Sounds right. Sounds good. <clears throat> Bridge nav. Can we do one zero meters at three two zero? Sorry, one let me repeat that please. One zero meters at bearing three two zero. Correct, thank you. Oh, that's better. We're a, we're a bit away. That's good. I think that was the ship's horn we just heard. Yeah, not sure why. Uh, one minute of silence, I think. Push here, see if it's as frustrating as. Stop. Yep, never mind.
What's this down here? It may just be a coil of a uh, line. Uh, yeah, that's yeah, that's just a coil. Winch for a crane or something, maybe? Yeah, maybe. Oh, which is probably right here. Yeah. That looks like steel cable. Yeah. Try and a rope, maybe. Yeah, it looks like steel cable to me. Does it? Yep. Yep. Coming out. All right. <clears throat> Trying to come out. There it goes. Pull like. We're at the bow. We should do another one of the same moves, 10 meters at yeah. 320. Yep, that's good, thank you. Yep. Ridge nav. What? Yeah. Can we please do a ship move one zero meters bearing three two zero. Thank you. Get a little glimpse down in that area that would normally be like a bosun's locker. Oh yeah, maybe. Please tell me there were paravanes on the foredeck. Paravanes? Did you see any paravanes? I was hoping to see them in the plans they're there, but they might not be. They look like kind of torpedoes with wings. I don't think so. Strapped down to the I foredeck I somewhere. Didn't see it. I, didn't, I didn't see them. Thanks, Jim. I'm going to try and zoom on right here if I can. Yep, go for zoom. Just a discoloration. It's weird. Oh, it's a uh, cover, like a service cover or something. What is that? There you go. Kind of weird. Uh, it looks like a cover and you would remove to access electronics or looks something. looks plastic, which they didn't have. No, it looks like a water bottle. 
for them very wide, but that oval is a uh, an access panel. Did you cross over this, or would, had we already yeah. gone on that? Yeah, we went over that. It was just a bunch of uh, hull plating that had fallen outward. Right, gotcha. Kind of a mess. There was also a, the barrel of a casemate gun, but there was no casemate part, and it uh, it seemed like uh, there was a good idea that um, that Russ had that maybe it, it was stored forward Yeah. for some reason. It was very strange. Uh -oh, they could have gotten there any other way. Yeah. There's a little light down into that bosun's locker again, or whatever that compartment would be called. Well, what's the question? Not for me, I was just pointing out. Okay. Can we get a little tilt up? Take tilt up. We're at it. Keep it going. There you go. Trying to, uh, out of frame, there's a rectangle that uh, opens down into the next deck below this one. Yeah. Right there. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, like an escape hatch kind of thing. Yeah, maybe uh, well. put lines down through there. Mm -hmm. When we were up higher, you can see the, the light was illuminating down inside there. Currently, we're hovering over the bow and like looking down on top of it. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. There was a moment where we weren't sure the bow was here because we saw it kind of break off, but that was where the hangar deck ended Oops. and was kind of broken, and that's where that uh, sh uh, hull plating had fallen out from. Oh. And then this was it's, this was lower. This section right ahead looks almost covered in sediment. Yeah, I think um, much of the wreck is because it kicked up so much when it landed. How far down would the anchor be? Oh, um, is no, that it? Right. It could. We could see it. It, it would just is be it right there. Sorry. Yeah, that could be it. All right. Looks like it may have hit bow first because it's plowed into the mud there. Yeah. May not be much chance of seeing that uh, crest then. Were you at the mud line already here? No, you can see under a little bit. Okay.
right, ready for the next move here? Yeah, sounds good. Um, the same thing sounds, I think, would work. Okay, 10 meters, 320. Yeah, we'll get a really good sense now if, if any of the tip of the bow is protruding, but it, it's not looking good. Yeah. Wow. Bridge nav. Let's do a ship move. One zero meters, bearing three two zero. Correct, thank you. Yeah, I see what you mean. Might be luckier on the port side. Yeah, look we'll at over there. Looks like it came down bow first. Sure does. A big ice cream scoop. Right. Though it actually could have dug all that out, there might be a, a visible steel in front of that sediment pile. Yep. I've got to say, we just witnessed one of the most beautiful hulas I've ever seen, and I've I've seen some hula. Well, that's good. So very moving. So sh uh, shore side, we're gonna um, obviously continue documenting this and, and flip around to the port side and take a look there. Um, my thought after that was to continue up the uh, Maybe sticking out the, right the port side um, to about a midships where yeah. we initially came down because that's the one quarter of the wreck we have yet to look at. Um, what are your thoughts? Is there anything else before we start that that you want to see in the next two to two and a half hours? I'd like to just come up to the front of this mud and see if anything protrudes in that pile yeah like and then then i think we everybody agree with the center line okay sounds good let me see the outline of it like when it comes to the, the tip there Did you see that thing on the right, Mike? Yeah, I'm not sure what that was. You took a look at that? Yeah, I think we're going to be moving closer over there. It was kind of at the, the yeah. limit of the shadow, or of the light. Yeah. Particularly interested in what is sticking up out there. Just oh, yeah, in front of that right. mound. Yeah, do you guys see it here? There's a, something oh, yeah. sticking out. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Is it possibly the bow sticking that's, out the other end? That's what we were thinking. Yeah. 
if it, eventually. Yeah, if it went in stern high, bow first, and then the stern came down, it could have lifted all this sediment up and exposed the very forward end. All right, how do we want to get there? Um, let's see. We are facing... One seven zero or one nine one nine zero. Um, maybe two two five 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 meters. Yeah. Okay. I'm thinking the same. Maybe ten meters though. Yeah, maybe ten. Yeah. Ten ten at two five five. Can try lateraling over. We're close. We're close enough. <sighs> Bridge nap. We do a move. One zero meters bearing two five five. Thank you. Well, maybe even further to the right. Hmm. I think that's the base of the mounts for the pie deck, potentially. Yeah, Russ. Yep. On the same page. I'm still having trouble with scale figuring out like if something's the size of a tin can or it's the size of a color. car. Uh, flight deck support. I'm only five meters off bottom so if that helps with your scale eh not really thank you though oh. i appreciate it could you uh spin to the right there was something in the sediment out there that i think we might be closer to looking at now well, a little further Not sure what it is, where it is. Yeah, that's all right. <laughs> well, those were really far forward, weren't they? It's got that teardrop shape. Oh yeah, that's right. Well, it looks like it's outside of that, if you were to continue that line of the rail. It looks like it's outboard. Yeah, it that. probably broke off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if we can... Go ahead. 
There is something more just off to the right. Yeah. In the segment. Yeah, I, I was just going to say if and, we can. Okay, go ahead. Keep going. I was just going to say, if, you know, once we finish this move, we'll be able to swing around it and look at this this sediment head on, mm. and then continue to the to the other side of the bow. You see that dark coming out of the bow? Where you just want to reach out and brush it off. <laughs> right. Mm. Just take a leaf blower to it. Well, unfortunately, fluid uh, dynamics would pretty much say that turning it on would just push you further away from this. It doesn't look like we're going to be able to visualize the front, huh? No, it doesn't look like it. It would be nice to turn and square up and get a look back. Yeah, we still should do that. Maybe come so that the porch is behind that bar and we can get a see what sort of view of the bow we can get. I tilt up and I can see if I can brighten it up for you. Tilt up? Yeah. Nah, nothing really, huh? Any chance we could request just a couple meters further forward of the bow? Yeah. Or maybe a couple more things. There is what I think that I think we've actually got to yeah. You guys, so Shore would like to continue to move a few more meters uh, to the right before we swing around to the side of the bow. All right. Thank you. Oh, well, be, be, be directly aft. Not aft. You, you want us to do wait, wait, You want us to do what? I think they want us to back, back up. Put more distance between us and the bow. Yep. That's it. So move on the reciprocal of our current heading. Yeah. Roger. Is that about 280? Yeah. 290? Yeah. 280, 290. Whatever, whatever it takes. So, so you guys want to move further aft? Uh, aft of uh, Atalanta. Oh, I see. Uh, five meters? Ten? Let's start with five. Bridge, Nav. We do five meters at bearing two nine zero. Thank you.
Well, if that emblem is exposed wood, it might be preserved. a shift change or watch change kind of soon and before I hopped off I wanted to make sure I acknowledged we've got a lot of viewers that have been watching and listening and like waiting to get to this point of the dive to come around and to see the bow and I just wanted to thank all of you for sharing this time and this space with us and um, I also just wanted to uh, reflect on and speak on the cultural protocol that a lot of us just uh, participated in so Hans mentioned the hula that we um, got to watch, and then we did have a moment of silence, and then um, our captain did blow the horn. And I was going to ask Hans, do you know um, the length of the horn? If there's a specific uh, reason why it was that length? No, I, I don't know a specific reason. I just simply say out of respect. Mm -hmm. It was quite nice. Mm -hmm. I think Malia Evans choreographed that dance, yeah. especially to the Okinawan folk song mm -hmm. that was uh, popular in Japan and has been for quite a while. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Pardon me. And I think the um, the title was was Voices of the Sea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was beautiful and. Um, this was right at sunset, um, so that's why we decided to have it now instead of towards the end of uh, the dive when Adelante is recovered. Um, but yeah, it was beautiful and very special. As well as the kava ceremony as an offering. Mm -hmm. uh, front row stayed in here to keep operations going, but we did swing one of the deck cameras around and put it up on the big monitor so we could participate in a way. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. Oh, I wonder if that's the teardrop shape of the base of another support. Try and get you to zoom on it, but zoom. Yeah, it looks like it, doesn't it? Could be. It's a little long, but can't can't say. Yeah, it's also collapsed a bit. That's probably. Yeah. I think it would have been so stout at the base it wouldn't show collapse like that. I don't know.
lying there in the sediment too, that the pole. Definitely. I think it's right under us. I think, yeah, right under us. I think it could be the jack staff. Watch change. Yep. Coming up on watch change. Watch change of video. Hello, Hello watch. Shoreside, stand by a few minutes while we change the watch. What the? Hi. Uh, at this point, do we want to move or we want to hold here? Do we Man, let's move? just hold here for a sec. While we're, while we're waiting for this watch change, I uh, just wanted to provide a little bit of an update. Uh, so we have almost exactly uh, two hours of bottom time on this, our fifth dive of the Ala Aumoana Kaiuli expedition to the Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument. Uh, we'll be uh, pulling the vehicle off the seafloor at 10 o'clock local times in two hours, and it'll be about a three and a half hour um, ascent to the surface. Um, after that, uh, we'll have a 14 hour transit tomorrow morning uh, before deploying the vehicles around 4 p.m. Uh, for a dive focused on the geology and biology of a uh, unmapped seamount that we'll map tomorrow morning. Uh, and then get to dive on for the very first time, and that's in the northwestern end of the Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument. Uh, and that will kind of mark the half point of this uh, very successful expedition already. Uh, we'll have uh, 14 days more of exploration. Uh, we'll conduct almost daily uh, ROV dives uh, focused on seamounts uh, throughout uh, this uh, area slowly moving back from the northwestern end uh, back and route to Honolulu. So we should have daily dives through about uh, September 25th. And then we'll conduct our final transit back to Honolulu where we'll pull into port on, to, on September 28th. Uh, and that will mark uh, the end of uh, this expedition. Uh, there will be uh, still a lot more exploring to come in this 2023 um, season. After that, we'll have an expedition focused on uh, demonstrating multi-vehicle exploration, an expedition uh, conducted with many of our partners from the Ocean Exploration Cooperative Institute that will uh, deploy three different vehicles, three different technologies at the same time to explore 
some area around the geologist seamounts. Uh, after that, we'll have uh, an ONR, uh, Office of Naval Research funded expedition throughout the main Hawaiian Islands. Uh, after that, we'll have a mapping cruise uh, south of Hawaii. And then ending the expedition season in November through December, we'll have a 30-day expedition to map areas around Jarvis Atoll. Uh, and that will culminate the 2023 uh, field season. Uh, but that's uh, uh, also stay tuned. Uh, we are in planning stages for the 2024 uh, field season that will kick off around May 2024. Uh, with the ship going through uh, some very exciting places around the central and western Pacific. A call for science input uh, will be circulated early in October. Uh, that will provide the exact details of the operating areas where we'll, uh, EV Nautilus will be operating in 2024. And as every season, uh, we do our planning uh, in collaboration with the science and ocean exploration community. So we have the, the, the rough operating areas for our expeditions. And then we uh, look through the science uh, resource management and exploration community to help us refine our exploration targets. There will be a form circulated where anyone can provide input, identify areas that they want to see more mapping in, see more ROV exploration, specific physical samples that should be collected, specific partners that should be involved. And that's the first step. Then we'll hold a, a series of webinars where we'll help refine those plans. Uh, so stay tuned uh, for that. That should be released in early October. And All right, we have switched out watches. Um, we are going to um, move a little bit back to the bow now. But uh, Catalina, I think we want to move. So we we tr we tried to inspect this uh, sediment pile and see if the bow was poking out, and it's not. So we want to kind of pirouette around it and then go to the other side and then go up the um, the port side of the of the bow. Okay. Sounds good. So I, I'm not sure. Whatever angle we're facing, though, is probably the direction we want to move right now. Okay. For like five or ten, me ten meters, maybe. Okay. Sounds good. So, Mike, I'm, we agree. I, I think it's, the tip of the bow is covered, so we're not going to see the crest or any yeah. of that sort. The pipe in front of it, I, I think, is the jack staff, and it's bent because it, it displaced when all this plowed in, but somehow isn't buried. Yeah. So we're good. We're good with proceeding. Sounds good. All right, the move has been called. Awesome, thank you. Yep. On another feature or on the other side. Yeah. Like a fan. Yeah. Look at that. Anybody starving? Yeah, Mike, as we bob up and down here, I, you can actually see that I think it's part of that bar jack stay just over on the right-hand lower corner. We don't really need to zoom in or zero in on that. We've got a good look on it on, at a, on the way in. But. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Silver Spring. Mike just stepped away for just a minute, but uh, we copy that.
Aloha ai hai, ai hai. Everybody, this is Daniel Kinzer, Science Communication Fellow, uh, who just jumped into the control van with the uh, with the amazing 8 to 12 watch. Glad to be back. You all look great. Plus Hans, plus the amazing Hans von Tilburg, who's been an honorary 8 to 12 watch member throughout these wreck dives. We really appreciate having him. I know he's thankful to have been rescued from his own home watch. Oh, oh. oh. <laughs> Just kidding. Oh. Just kidding, odds. <laughs> jokes, jokes, jokes. Oh, but uh, yeah, thankful thankful to be back to spend these um, next couple hours, our final hours as an expedition and as a watch team on board uh, any, of, any of the wrecks associated with the Battle of Midway. And uh, we'll be moving on to um, to explore the sacred waters of Papahanaumokuakea and from more of a geological and biological perspective, but uh, we just want to continue to pay our respects and uh, learn what we can from the amazing sacrifice, um, the amazing bravery shown in um, laying at rest here on the seafloor, 5,400 meters below the surface, well over three miles miles down so Daniel Kinzer 8 to 12 watch and uh, when when anyone else on watch feels like uh, introducing themselves I'm sure the internet and those ashore and everyone else would be excited to hear your voices again and have me be quiet Aloha ahi ahi kako. good evening everyone um, my name is Mahina Lani Cavallari. I'm from the island of Oahu, and I'm so privileged to be here with you all. As Dan had mentioned, um, this will be one of our last archaeological dives, and then moving forward, we're going to focus on um, our geology and biology, and we have a lot of great scientists on board who will assist and lead uh, that portion of the huaka'i. Um, as you may already know, we are in Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument, the sacred realm of Po, uh, the sacred depths of Kanaloa. And over the past few days of diving on different um, wreck sites, it has conjured up a lot of different emotions that have stirred up for many of us, and we're all processing it, digesting it, coping with it in various ways. Um, this evening, we offered a ho'okupu, a gift of... Um, of hula, of a dance, um, just to commemorate and honor all of the bravery of the servicemen and women who were here, who lived on these ships, who worked on these ships, who celebrated on these ships and fought dearly on these ships as well. And so just to pay um, respect to the lives lost, we offered a dance, um, myself and some of the other vahine on board, some of the other women, um, and, you know, most of our crew members also got to just come and join us. And we also had two kane, two men on board who offered ava, which is a ceremonial drink, on, over the side of the vessel, uh, just to pay re further respect. So, very grateful, very humbled to be here, to share, and then to connect. Mahalo for joining us. Thank you. Mahalo Mahina was an honor, a profound uh, privilege to get to participate and to get to watch all of you Wahine look uh, just offer that beautiful, beautiful hula uh, for this place, um, for those who fought so hard here and to all of the ancestors as well as Kanaloa himself. So it was, that was, uh, thank you so much again for doing that. One of our other amazing hula dancers down the end of the line, <laughs> the one and only, Light. Aloha guys, my name is Kukui. I come from the island of Maui. And I'm so blessed and privileged to be here with all of you folks today on board and on shore. And um, I was also so um, honored to be able to witness uh, the beautiful offering that happened today and to be in everybody's presence and to be able to offer that, the presence and the hula and the ava to um, the people who sacrificed everything for their countries. So, mahalo guys.
Um, well, I'm Virginia. I um, am currently sitting next to the data logger, Kukui, who does a fantastic job. Um, I am a PhD student at Florida State University, currently studying deep sea communities on seamounts. Um, kind of a general deep sea ecologist. And um, yeah, I just feel really honored and privileged to be a part of this, looking at these, you know, um, these cultural ties to the seafloor. Um, and um, yeah, really honored to be a part of uh, these cultural ties that, you know, tie us all together too. So, yeah. Mahalo, Virginia. It's a, it's a blessing to be learning from you and with you. Thank you for being here. Nicely said. Uh, Hans van Tilburg, I am the I, uh, maritime archaeologist and historian for NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. And so it's, it's been a very special mission for us, obviously. And I'm Daniel, I'm glad to have your watch on board to kind of bring this portion of the mission to a conclusion and to close the door, so to speak, on our witness of this location and these sites. But uh, the information will exist, be preserved, that heritage will be preserved and the history will be preserved and will add to the story and we'll share that with the public. So um, it's been an amazing journey. Absolutely. Mahalo, Hans. It's such a joy to, uh, all jokes aside, all of our watches are just remarkable. And, and this watch um, uh, is just so near and dear to my heart, getting to experience this with all of you, um, this life-changing exploration and expedition. And um, yeah, Hans has said so well. All right. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, this is Val Finlayson. I am a postdoc uh, an isotope geochemist, um, kind of general geologist uh, as needed uh, on this expedition. Um, I'm one of the science co-leads. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm a postdoc from uh, University of Maryland. Um, I'm, I'm super thrilled to be out here and absolutely humbled and honored by the last few dives that we've, uh, we've been able to uh, uh, do on these wrecks. And I sincerely hope that uh, we, we can help bring some closure to families that have been affected by, uh, by this battle. Val, it's so easy to, to, uh, to be so fully impressed by your depth of knowledge, your abilities as a scientist, your, your curiosity and your passion. Um, and yet that's, that's not even the best thing that you bring. It's amazing your leadership, just your outstanding uh, character. You're just carrying our eight to 12 watch leading us um, through these very challenging missions and uh, doing it with grace and ease and and great friendship and we we really appreciate that. I know I can speak for everybody. We really appreciate Thank you. that. I don't Mike, even know how to reply to that. The, <laughs> we'll pass it over to the man who needs no introduction. He's been with you for three days straight. Three days straight <laughs> and counting. Do you remember who you are, Mike? Do you need any help who? introducing you? I think that's what? questionable at this point. <laughs> um, Mike Brennan. Maritime archaeologist from Search Inc. I'm the co-lead uh, co scientist for this uh, expedition. Um, yeah, just we're very. Ex I'm very excited that uh, you know we managed to get three incredible dives. Uh, the weather, the engineering, the navigation all um, worked in our favor and worked really well. Um, we got another hour 45 on site, but uh, you know it's it's been really great to get eyes on these. Rex, um, one of them for the first time ever yesterday, um, and these other two to get more high resolution uh, video data um, to, to understand the, the battle damage and the site formation processes, um, you know, so that they, we can establish a baseline characterization for future work at these sites, you know, in 10 or 20 years, see what they look like, because uh, you have to start somewhere when you're gonna start comparisons. So, um, yeah, learning a lot. Very excited that we managed to get here, and thank big thanks to everyone uh, at Sea and Ashore who uh, who contributed to this effort. Absolutely, a, a incredible team effort. It's a Kako thing, Lao Lima. Um, many hands required, and uh, just like Val, incredible to have Mike on board, who, along with, of course, also with Hans, um, 
but really uh, as, as the science leads, taking on a lot of responsibility and, and delivering on the mission objectives. And of course, it takes the gifts from Kanaloa, incredible uh, luck as well. We have to have uh, great weather. A lot of things have to work in our favor, but along with our expedition leads and our crew, um, just uh, it's an honor to, to watch what great leadership looks like. So yeah. just an awesome back row all around. Yeah, world class, eight to 12 back row, can't be beat. Thanks, Daniel. Yeah. <laughs> Eight to 12 plus Mike and Hans. <laughs> plus Mike and You guys are honorary. You're honorary now. We've, we've adopted you, Hanai. Sounds good. Is Hanai. that like probation? <laughs> yeah, you, you passed your probation period, Hans. You're, you're all the way in. Um, but you know, the back row really uh, wouldn't be anything without the front row. They, uh, they're the ones delivering this incredible view of uh, these wrecks taking us into the depths of the ocean and uh, doing it, making it look so easy with their professionalism, their skill, um, and also just adding tremendous uh, character, great stories, a wealth of experience um, to ocean exploration, different perspectives. Front row, when you guys have time, uh, we'd love to, we'd love to uh, reintroduce you to the internet and all of our viewers at home online. Yeah, I can, um, I can start. I will start quickly with an operational note. So. That jump that we made has really not translated into anything. It actually looks like we've gotten a little further. <laughs> and I made okay. another, so I called another 10 meter jump. Um, we'll see. We yeah, I think, I think we're back to the spot where we met you, uh, your last watch, which was trying to change directions on you. Yeah. I yeah, think like, actually, you, we, yeah. I think you came on it when we yeah. got to the stern and you came on when we got to yeah. the bow. Yeah, yeah. So, I was about to say there's something with this watch. Yeah, yeah. so, so. Um, understood and we'll, we'll do our best. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Um, but yeah, my name is Catalina Rubiano. I'm a master's student at the University yeah. of South Florida, and yeah, I'm serving here as a navigator, trying to get us around, <laughs> struggling. Not at all, Catalina. Handling all challenges with grace, and uh, we know you're, we know you're fierce and want to just get out there and move, move the ROV into place yourself. But uh, <laughs> we're glad we're keeping everything safe and including you. Yeah, absolutely. The one and only, Robert. Yeah, I'm uh, Robert Waters. I'm sitting in the pilot seat. Uh, it's tremendous to be out here and see this. It's probably the most historic dive sites we've been to in, the, in my time here anyway. Uh, hoping to come back, but I don't know if I can do it in 10 or 20 years. So I hope <laughs> it's before that. <laughs> Um, my name is Zach Gonzalez, um, I'm Robert's co-pilot right now, I've uh, been doing ROV for a few years, um, really enjoying this, it's really amazing to see all these wrecks and stuff like that, uh, almost not a full grasp to, to understand that what we're seeing exactly, well not, not really understanding, just kind of just in awe of it, honestly. Absolutely. Thank you, Zach. And I'm Amber Flynn, the video engineer. Uh, just really uh, grateful and humbled to be here uh, amongst like, so much talent, uh, both our you know front row, our back row, and then also uh, the support that we've been getting on the shore as well. Absolutely. And uh, also a big thank you for including us in uh, the hula and the ceremony. It was really special. Thank you very much. All right, and uh, I'm sure they've had to introduce themselves many times. Um, uh, Jim is uh, maybe rivals Mike for who's uh, who's been awake the most uh, throughout these throughout these dives, but uh, and many on many of the team in Silver Spring, but uh, Silver Spring, if you'd like and whenever you'd like, we'd love to have you jump in and and uh, share a little bit more about the amazing team that's gathered there in NOAA's Exploration Command Center. Hey. Uh, Thanks so much, team. Um, and I mean that so sincerely. This is Phil Hartmeyer, marine archaeologist for NOAA Ocean Exploration. Uh, Jim, uh, co-conspirator, lead scientist ashore, um, expert in so many things, has departed just very recently uh, for some well-deserved shut-eye oh, yeah, and some rest. Absolutely. Uh, but certainly uh, for me and, and the few left standing here, um, 
Uh, the momentum is only building from the impact of this mission, of the purpose, of the reasoning for being here. Um, it's just thinking about what this team has been able to see just in a few days is outstanding and keeping in mind always the reality and of the challenge to do it is is incredible. Yes, it is. It's absolutely incredible. So thank you all so much from from all of us here, certainly, and um, and I certainly want to pass it off to us, the colleagues here. So. Thanks, Phil. Uh, my name is Sean. Hey, uh, my name is Shawna Daniel. I'm uh, with the Naval History and Heritage Command. I'm one of the archaeologists as well as the artifact conservator. Um, it's been quite a pleasure to uh, be a part of this. Uh, as I was mentioning uh, before, it's just amazing um, what we're seeing here. Uh, and uh, it's just fantastic that uh, this was an opportunity for us. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and the uh, the only last person standing here is me, Frank Kintellis. Um I'm with NOAA's Office of Ocean Exploration Research, and uh, it's been a pretty amazing few days here watching this expedition explore the tip of incredibly deep water, and to see uh, evidence of this this historic battle. It's been a real pleasure. And uh, we appreciate your work out there. Thank you. Thanks so much, Frank. Yeah, thank you very much. It's it's uh, been so important um, to to watch this collaboration extend across so many time zones, and uh, just the power of this our ability to communicate um, with you all, and with our colleagues in Japan as well. Um, just. Uh, just added so much rich richness, so many layers of, of knowledge and understanding that I know will continue to grow upon, but just laid an absolutely wonderful foundation um, with this exploration. And it is, uh, I think, uh, really blowing our hearts and minds <laughs> that we, that we uh, at what we were able to witness in such a relatively short period of time. And, and um, just really want to thank the, the expedition team here on board um, for making this happen and, and making it uh, making it a rich learning experience uh, for all of us. So. If you're uh, tuning in online, watching from home or from work or from school, uh, we are nearly 18,000 feet deep over 5,400 meters uh, below the surface on what is the fifth dive, number five dive of NA-154 um, Exploration Vessel Nautilus Ala Amoana Kaiuli Expedition to Papahanao Mokuakea, um, where we are uh, wrapping up our time on these historic shipwrecks, aircraft carriers sunk in the Battle of Midway. Uh, we've spent the last four or five days uh, moving uh, between these wrecks and, and diving ROV Atalanta on these wrecks um, to try to characterize them, um, get get video and get cameras on them. Many of them for the first time, uh, or one of them for the first time, and all three of them um, this extensively for the first time. So uh, what a privilege uh, to bring them back to life, bring their stories back to life. Uh, honor all of those associated. There are many people uh, many people still alive today uh, who are deeply connected to the events of the Battle of Midway, uh, who know it, and then, of course, all of us, especially those of us who call Hawaii home. This was uh, uh, really reshaped Hawaii uh, entirely, um, and also the rest of the Pacific um, entirely. So uh, had so many profound impacts and uh, we hope that this expedition shines a light on the legacy of that battle, which, uh, which in my mind at least, and I think many of our minds, is um, the peace that has ensued from mm -hmm. that point, the great friendship, the deep friendship and collaboration, uh, not only between the United States and Japan, but 
uh, between so many partners and collaborators, um, crossing institutions, crossing international borders, and I'm um, just thankful to be a part of it. And uh, really glad that all of you are watching, either on YouTube or on Nautilus Live. You can come, come to Nautilus Live, ask your questions, um, post your comments, share your stories with us. Um, it's really touching to us to hear about the ways that this dive and this moment in history have impacted you. Um, in a lot of ways, we you are explorers with us, uh, and, and we depend on your knowledge, um, your own research. So many people out there have uh, done such great scholarship and, um, and research into the events surrounding what uh, the wreckage of which we're, we're, we're witnessing. But mahalo, everyone. Yeah, most definitely, Dan. And like you had said earlier in one of our previous watches, that this is a privilege of a lifetime. And to be seeing all of these wrecks, I mean, it it does bring a lot of kaumaha. There's a great heaviness, um, a great heaviness of the heart. And I know that a lot of us on board are experiencing just the tragedy that took place here. Um, but being able to lean on one another Especially this past evening, during one of our Ho'okupu hula ceremonies, we were really able to bond and then lift our collective morale as we grieve and process this together. And also it gives us great hope um, because this has been a very collaborative and collaborative effort, various uh, cultural ties, partnerships that have flourished um, because of this. Ala'omwana Kai'uli expedition. So very grateful as we close um, here on this dive, then we're kind of able to take this and it, I know personally it has changed my thoughts and perspective and of the Battle of Midway and of war forever. Mahalo, Mahina. How are we doing, Catalina? So I put in <laughs> uh, another 15 meter jump, uh, facing yep. towards the bow, and it looks like we're we're getting there. Yeah, we're, we're starting, starting to see we're some We're moving change. a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Our uh, earlier dives on the USS Yorktown and Akagi, uh, there was, felt like there was so much to see. It felt like the, the ships, although facing some pretty heavy battle damage, were still largely intact. Same cannot be said for cargo. We have uh, a debris field surrounding the ship um, and the upper, upper levels, the flight deck and hangar decks, um, largely gone, um, blown off um, by heavy bomb impact um, and ultimately this ship was scuttled it was abandoned and, and sank intentionally by the japanese but uh, only after it had fa already faced really severe damages um, so that's what we're seeing we're not seeing the same kinds of uh, largely intact shipwrecks um, still some incredible views on kaga some important learning and some important history um, but a little bit different visual uh, for those of us who have been tuning in over the last few days. We are just, I believe, just off the bow. Someone can jump in and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we're uh, facing the ship now. And, yep, uh, that's right. And just off the bow and, and gonna, are we making our way over the midline now or are we going up uh, the port side? No, or? we're gonna, uh, yeah, we're gonna go up the port side. So we're gonna flip around you know, that, that sounds like it's a fast action, but <laughs> we're just going to spin this very around. slowly, flip yeah. around uh, and look at the uh, port side of the bow and then continue up the port side. Because we came down uh, amidships when we started the dive, so we haven't actually quite circumnavigated the wreck yet. All right. Like we've done on the other vessels, doing our best to, to get a full uh, circumnavigation, a full, a full coverage. Um, uh, on the other ships, it was of the flight deck line and... and uh, uh, and the hull, but uh, this is just the hull. Uh, no flight deck, although we did jump over and examine some of the other debris, I think I heard. Yep. Um, 
and uh, so we've characterized some of what could be found uh, just off the main part of the wreck. Some of what we've been exploring and talking about are, are some of the changes that were rapidly make, uh, being made to, to naval warfare and naval warfare technologies. Um, these uh, Japanese carriers were not or originally planned or designed as carriers. That was, uh, they were modified um, after, after completion or near completion to, uh, to be able to uh, launch and receive aircraft um, as naval warfare moved to the skies. Um, during World War II, and so some of the uh, various technologies involved we've been looking at are representative of that sort of shift um, in, in warfare technology and warfare strategy and type, and the Battle of Midway was uh, sort of a major milestone in that transition. Um, from what I understand, I'm a fairly lousy student of history, to be honest, but uh, I've been trying my best to pay attention and take notes as some of the experts have been uh, sharing their stories and, and knowledge. And so thank you to them for being my teacher along this, along this journey. You'll be tested on the same curve <laughs> as, as everyone anyway, but uh, <laughs> you got it exactly right, oh, Daniel. Excellent. So you're saying I passed. Okay, we'll C see. minus. Oh, <laughs> I'll take them. We definitely have some straight A students uh, here in the back row, but we also have those uh, many of us who, who may not have been uh, straight A students. Maybe for whatever reason, school, academics weren't uh, weren't always top priority or exactly our cup of tea. So it's awesome to see um, what genius looks like in all of its forms. Uh, we have people who are so gifted at learning in so many different ways, and and that's what I think one of the things that makes this. Um, learning out here in the field on expedition, this exploration, so much fun. Uh, and I'm just so appreciative of all the different journeys that have brought people here and all the different ways that they've developed deep knowledge um, in their own fields and beyond. And, and mostly impressed with just how, how we all learn. It's just fun to watch, watch all of us um, dig into the information, make guesses, ask questions, explore things together. It's, uh, how learning should be in my mind and yeah oh yeah i strongly feel that way i mean every child gravitates toward education differently towards learning differently different methods and different environment and i think if we as a society can nurture that then we would have wide success across classes and you know, countries really, but if we could just pour in that same kind of nurturing to every student. And I think that's what's beautiful here on board is that we do have such a diverse group of people with very different backgrounds, very different um, career paths or educational journeys and how we all kind of found this. And, you know, this is just one chapter, one season of that. Um, and, you know, as we are privileged to be here. We just kind of have the opportunity to continue to add those layers, add those chapters to our book and grow as an individual. And, you know, I see that that is our kuleana too, to pour and nurture into our students, our haumana. And I see the need in my home islands in Hawaii and our paiaina. I deeply see the need for that. Hey, oh. Yeah, it is a it's a deep wish. I was I was speaking with uh, our co-expedition leader and communications and outreach director Megan Cook here at Ocean Exploration Trust and on board EV Nautilus with us last night about you know thinking about the way that we conduct this expedition, the way that we conduct this research and this exploration, um, and it's not just a it's not just a model or a template for how ocean exploration can happen, but it really to me is some about something even bigger than that. It's a um, it's an opportunity to explore and, and consider how we might uh, learn together as a community and how do you create a learning community, um, no matter where you are or what you're exploring. And I think, uh, I certainly hope that I'm able to bring back some of what I learned on board 
here. I feel similarly about our time, Mahina, our, our time uh, with Hokulea and Hikianalia and our Ohanava'a. Yeah. Um, but how can we bring those kinds of environments into the lives of our, of our young people, our Opio, our Keiki back home uh, and across the Paiaina? Uh, it's my privilege uh, to get to do a lot of that work with Purple Maya Foundation back home. And um, I hope and I believe that these, these times where I'm getting to witness this are, are making me better uh, for our communities back home and, and going to help me do my job even better uh, once we return home to Oahu. Yeah, most definitely. I mean, when we step into these huaka'i, onto these journeys, we learn um, new methods and ways of advocacy and leadership. And I do see that we are able to take all of these lessons back to our communities, back to our home, and to really cultivate that love for learning or that need um, for learning in different ways and different systems back at within our own home communities. Um, what I feel so comfortable here within this control van is that, you know, although we may not have the same educational um, journey together and each of us are very different, we have cultivated a very safe space to learn and explore together, to ask questions here. And I think that's extremely critical and imperative to one's education and the success of one um, the success of someone's educational journey is to be able to feel safe enough to explore to feel safe enough to ask questions to feel safe enough to have that curiosity and to have teachers have kumu have adults have alaka'i leaders who will facilitate um, that curiosity creativity and really create a safe environment for students, for home mana to learn and to thrive. Oh, well said, Mahina. Mahalo. I love hearing, I don't know uh, if people want to think about this on a minute, uh, for a minute, but uh, I love hearing about uh, what sort of learning experiences people really cherish and remember. You know, who are some of the, the lessons that they've learned, place, you know, who a kai they've been on, or you know, classroom projects that they've done, or I find most of the time it's something outside of school, but doesn't have to be, can be inside of school too. But uh, just the moment where that learning was really inspiring to you, you felt safe, you felt like you were learning in your community. You know, for me, it would be um, obviously this experience, uh, um, but also our experience on Hokulea and Hikianalia. And I'm always curious to know um, what sort of learning experiences really inspire, um, inspire people and uh, kind of help them take that next step. So if, if anyone here, back row or front row, while we're looking down this beautiful view of the bow of Kaga, uh, wants to share that, uh, and also understand if we need to move into some operational or archeological talk too. Yeah, let me just really quick check in with Catalina on that. Sorry about that. Um, so, I was gonna see is like a 20 meter jump maybe just because yeah. I feel okay because I feel like the response coming back this way is uh, yeah. either catching up with the change of direction. Yeah, it should be yeah. fine. Okay, cool. Yeah, thanks. Daniel, I think you're right. I mean, I'll, I'll, I've said it before, but I'll say it again. This mission has been one of the most remarkable learning experiences I've had in the recent past. I mean, I'm not. Let's just say I'm not as young as I was some number of years ago. But, um, and I'll, I'll frankly, I'll admit that, you know, I, I was uh, kindly invited to participate and, and saw that the archaeological portion of this mission was, you know, X amount long, this long. And I thought, well, what am I going to do for the rest of the time? <laughs> you know, I mean, I'll just be on the ship. But, you know, I am, I am happy to get back to the seamounts and the geology yeah. of these, these undersea volcanoes and plumes because I'm still learning yeah. I'm and I'm and I'm happy to do it yeah. and, and this is such a rich and collaborative atmosphere and the amazing thing is you know it is being shared real time I mean lessons will come from this and, and you'll take these back to the islands we all will but it's being shared now in the ship to shore communications that you guys have been doing Seems like 24-7. I mean, you, I see you get up at 2 in the morning to come into the studio down here to, to meet the, the time needs of, of schools, you know, across the world. Are you kidding me? That's fantastic. And then, then just this broadcast as well for the public, 
who might be, you know, listening just because they're, they're curious or, or maybe for fun, but then there's a lot of information. Absolutely. On the archaeological aspects, and then after this, we'll continue with the biological dives and the geology, and those are all live. Yeah. And those are all filled with, you know, information from the deep ocean and some of the, I'd say some of the, the, the real specialists doing the important work today, looking at these things. Absolutely. And, and pushing our understanding forward. And it's happening here now, and it's accessible publicly, and it's being broadcast in the classroom. So I, I don't know how much more amazing any kind yeah. of <laughs> platform, any kind of ship could do, frankly. It's pretty amazing. Sorry, I got on a no? kind of a, no, it's kind great. of a soapbox. Sorry to really quick jump in, but Jeez. I think this is the other of the mounts that we, the other one from here is in the sediment down there. Oh, wow, yeah. So w once we get over there, we can take another, a better look at that. Oh, yeah. Because the other one was in the sediment pile just like kind of below us. So these are really far forward. Yeah. Yeah, when well, you look at the diagram, they are really yeah. far forward. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. There right you go. So we, right yeah, we the, have both of those Right mounts. at the prow. And Mike, although we're, we're going to be moving up the starboard side, we're, we're sort of still on that sort of port corner of the bow now? Uh, or are we on the opposite. starboard side? We're, oh, we're on the starboard side. We're going side. to the port side. Got it. Oh, got it. Got you it. said that these are mounts? Yeah, so th uh, these were long, tall uh, pillars that the f held up the flight deck. Uh, the flight deck extended from the hangar deck far out over the bridge. Um, so, uh, yeah, but th that wasn't always the case. Kaga didn't, the flight deck didn't always go all the way to the bow. Right. It used to cut off at the hangar deck, but they extended it probably in 38, okay. 1938. Thank you. Yeah, they're an upgrade. Yeah. Well, they probably needed a longer deck. Oh, yeah, they did. For bigger planes that could take off. Yeah, that's right. I think the history of the um, renovations and the reasonings and and then also, you know, um, the actual like end product, I think it's so interesting and so intertwined with history and, um, you know, whether that be just the, the vessel itself or um, trying to make speed or how aircraft has changed. It's really yeah. kind of fascinating. Well, and, they, and there were uh, advancements in aircraft just between the period of the war. So the U.S. aircraft were considered in initially to be very clunky relative to the Japanese fighter planes, the Zeros. And, like, they could, like, fly loops around us. But really, some of the pilots who came back from the Battle of Coral Sea were like, well, you know, you have to, um, you know, to kind of double team them. And then, and then you can maneuver around them. Uh, but then um, I think in 43 we got... Um, I forget what they were called, but we've got up, up, upgraded planes, uh, newer models um, that were, I think, some like some of like the Hellcats and and uh, ones like that that you know were able to take on some of these lighter, faster planes that the Japanese had. So like there were developments in in aviation technology even just in the short four years that we were in the war. Right, right. I mean, there's changing very quickly. I mean, look at the fact that we went from biplanes to monowing planes in these instances where they're yeah. building these carriers. Yeah. They built those Japanese carriers with multiple flight decks because planes were all very light, had, oh, yeah. had, bi, had bi wings, and they could launch from those decks. And all of a sudden, hey, you guys should have foreseen this coming. Yeah. Planes <laughs> have right. mono wings now, they're heavier, it's not going to work. So they had to make massive changes, massive reconstruction and redesign. To come up with what we've been looking at on these dives, and they and the, the Japanese were very, very uh, revolutionary and and creative. Like I mean, we see how they have the the islands on opposite sides, and they have the smokestacks that are all wonky. They're pointing downward, which is just crazy. Um, but it seemed to work for them. It's just the cool, cool looking design. Um, but they like they and Hans can speak much more about this. But they actually developed a submarine that could that was an, an aircraft carrying submarine that could surface and launch an aircraft and then submerge again. Yeah, uh, those, and, those and, were amazing. And the wrecks of those, there's two wrecks off Hawaii? Yeah. Um, I mean, and that's just like, I remember I was in, I was touring the uh, Hawaii Undersea Research Lab one time that I was in Hawaii, and I saw a poster. I was just like, what the heck is that? That can't be real. They're like, oh, no, that's right off the coast. That was a legit massive submarine that, could, that actually had a hangar that they could pressurize, come up, and then launch a plane. 
Three planes. Three yeah. planes. Yeah. In both America and Japan, there are many people who study innovation processes and the history of innovation look at this time period as uh, something that propelled both of those mm -hmm. countries to uh, uh, to become some of the most innovative and creative on Earth. A lot of yeah. military spending um, went into investing in uh, educating for experimentation, for engineering, for innovation across all kinds of science and technology fields. and. Um, you know, a lot of our everyday things that we take for granted were developed um, during, you know, with this time period of World War II. So it was a period of such rapid change and um, and uh, left left Japan and, and the United States well positioned for a global economy that was going to really start globalizing and, and valuing that kind of technology innovation more and more. And then there were there some um, creative innovations that really did not work such of course, as, such of as course, um yeah. my favorite one is uh the the ice battleship um so <laughs> i believe he was from england um he he developed a type of ice with that was mixed with sawdust and he would wanted to build a battleship or maybe an aircraft carrier i don't remember out of it and that if you got a hole in it you could just patch it with more water um <laughs> and it would just freeze and so he built a whole prototype i think somewhere in northern canada um, the problem was that it melted <laughs> because, yeah. they, because they realized that they weren't only going to be fighting in below freezing temperatures. Yeah. Anytime they took it further south, it just didn't do that great. So, <laughs> but they, I believe they built a whole prototype. Um, oh, I think really? they did a, there's an episode on Discovery Channel about it. It was, it was just like, I just love hearing like so these creative ideas that really didn't work too well, but they're still really creative ideas. To and be able to patch your ship with water, that's great. It's those, um, it's that kind of experimentation, right, in the, in the innovation process that uh, all those bad ideas take us somewhere new. Oh, yeah, right? the Wright brothers do, are yeah. crazy, too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. All those bad ideas take us to new places that uh, we hadn't considered before. And, and I think, um, you know, for me, again, like I think about the legacy of World War II, and, and I, I think it's so much more than these shipwrecks. I think the story of, of the wreckage, of the battle, of the loss, uh, it has to be complemented with the story of, of hope and resilience and innovation and and peace um, that came after after these conflicts. So. Yeah, I love the uh, the the concept of the the submarine aircraft carrier because I mean it 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 did work. But the, the number of times where that was necessary might have been few, but I mean submarines just went in a different direction, you know. Like, but I, th I think the concept of the surprise attack and getting planes up somewhere that nobody expects you know japanese planes to appear from is is fascinating but you know submarines went from you know more like the sneak attack with torpedoes that the u-boats did you know and then we and then we developed nuclear powered submarines and it, you know the whole direction of that changed but it's it's a really cool concept absolutely I gotta admit, I'm still stuck on this idea of an ice ship. Yeah, <laughs> I've never, oh, yeah. I've honestly never I heard build of that one until now. today. I want to build one. Oh, let's do it. But specifically mixed with <laughs> sawdust. Yeah, yeah. for yeah. stability. For stability. If, <laughs> if not for. Uh, not cold, just for decoration. If not for refrigeration. There won't be too many places on the planet left very soon that it can uh, right. where ice boat will be uh, super useful, but. Uh, I'm I'm game to I'm game to f try to figure this one out. It sounds like fun. Hans, it, it brings up that the, the soapbox uh, point minute. that you made earlier <laughs> is uh, it, is one of my two favorite things. Two of my favorite things in the control van are watching experts totally geek out on things that they love <laughs> and just uh, be so um, just so into something, just so a part of what's going on. But then my other my second favorite thing is watching experts be totally stumped but show the same sort of joy and just enthrallment at trying to appreciate this new knowledge, this new experience. Um, right, we love it when something's new. I know it. It's, a, it's, really, uh, it's really a beautiful thing to observe, and uh, I'm sure it, uh, one day right, I ahead. might know enough, might know enough to be one of those experts, but uh, I'm glad you guys get to experience it. Who says you're not an expert in what you do? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was thinking that. Oh boy. <laughs> oh boy. Oh boy. Although I, I don't care for the word. I don't know any experts who care for that word, actually. Yeah, I think I think one of the things about being an expert is actually 
uh, being able to understand what the amount of that you don't know. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. I mean, too much pressure with that word. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes you come across things that uh, change your paradigms mm -hmm. about a topic, and uh, that's usually one of the times where you feel like you know the least about something you've been studying for decades. Mm -hmm. just, just because it's so brand new, you just have to rethink the whole thing. We do need masters, though, sometimes, and uh, I'm glad that I'm glad to be uh, friends with a few. And it keeps me safe and keeps me learning. And uh, so I appreciate you all for your mastery. I won't call you experts or <laughs> or master or sir or ma'am if you don't want me to, but uh, uh, but I will uh, definitely respect your knowledge and and thank you for it. It's it's wonderful to watch. Mm -hmm. Is that another pylon support, okay. you think, Mike? Well, the, maybe the, well, yeah, we're not at the corner of the forward hangar yet, I think. They got a hot tub on the bow, too, though. I see it over there. Yeah, I was just looking at that. It's not really a hot tub. <laughs> oh, sorry. We were calling it sorry, uh, those are 12 hours ago. Those are two individual hot tubs. Yeah. <laughs> the, now, one now, the, the one at the stern was shared. Now, now, let's get back to the topic of capstan, not capstan. That was an interesting <laughs> discussion. That looks like a capstan. It's, yeah, it it's does. got the teeth, the cogs to catch the chain. Looks like it. And it goes, the chain goes around and right down to the chain locker. So it says uh, capstan. Yeah, well, I, I, think, I think we sort of ended up landing kind of casually on. The, the one at the stern being a support for the, the boat deck, but yeah. it's just such a weird shape. Like, why build it as a circle? Right. Just to trick us. Yeah. Well, in a, in a couple of days, we will be restarting our uh, debate over whether it is a sea cucumber or a nudibrank, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. This is much in the same uh, realm as that. <laughs> well, I labeled that one the uh, the nudie beauty, and I labeled I labeled this one the hot tub. So uh, we can find them on we can find the we can find the reels. Just gotta look them up. Oh, I see. <laughs> oh my gosh! All right, so that there that. is the is where the hangar deck starts up again. Yeah. Oh yeah. And all the rusticles. <laughs> I have to say, this would have been a really cool ship to see in person, like mm -hmm. like uh, when still afloat. Yeah, this is okay. a this is a dramatic area here. It's not intact, but it's, no. it it speaks to the event. Yeah, what incredible damage! Um, but also, I love that invitation to imagine what this would have looked like whole. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Mike. It's uh, an important part of this process is um, bringing this ship back to life, bringing it back to the surface placing all those sailors on there and and uh, telling that story, um, that complex, that layered story, but uh, it can be hard to do, but there are uh, many recreations and models of the ship, some images of the ship before it went to battle in Midway. Uh, for those of you watching at home, uh, we've been learning a lot. I've been learning a lot from people who have obviously spent a lot of time researching and, and have deep uh, care and admiration for this vessel and such a creative design as Mike was describing and Hans. So uh, encourage people to do their own own little bit of an investigation into uh, what cargo looked like and, and uh, sailed like um, back when it was on the surface over 80 years ago. Uh, so Nav, it seems like we're gonna need to come a little bit further uh, to the side of the ship, yeah? Figu figured you already figured that out. I can't hear you. Okay, good. She got it. Yeah, I was actually right in the middle of calling that up to the bridge, so oh, we're, on, we're on it. <laughs> so this looks like a portion of side of hangar that's just kind of flipped over on its back and lying yeah. on top of the overhead to the lower hangar. Yeah, I mean, if this was, um, if it did come in bow first, as it looks, this, you know, this could have been flopped uh, flipped backwards by the movement of water past the yeah past the bow yeah lined with anemones hmm. 
Anemone. <laughs> I wonder who came up with that word. Because I think they're playing a joke on all of us. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I wouldn't rule it out. <laughs> it's like how you spell Tino 4. You're right. <laughs> Think about it. If we were invited to invent new words, why wh why would we invent words? Just to just to yeah, mess with everybody. You gotta keep up with else. the cultural changes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you always gotta invent new words to name things in biology. That's right. All right. So uh, anemone originates from Greek, where uh, animos means wind, and uh, that evolved into uh, anemone in Greek, which means wind flower. Oh. And then, yeah, the same sort of thing for uh, the Latin version without any special characters that originated in the mid-16th century. Oh, wow. The, so, bl the blame goes back a long ways. Yeah, all the way back to, to Greece. Yeah, they probably weren't messing with us. It, probably that's just, not. That's just their word. I so, don't know. I don't, those, those philosophers, tricksters. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I had a thought about the pillars and the, uh -huh. the holes and such and um, the the googles actually kind of um, but anyways I was like well circles might actually be able to hold more weight than a square um, and so I did I looked it up and it is you know the circle can be viewed as having 360 like weight bearing like points instead yeah. of just like four corners um, and so it's potentially a stronger shape and therefore you might be able to get away with less like weight and less for your column area, yeah. versus a square yeah and they were trying to make it um uh lightweight because they were so tall well that's a good good theory it's out there what is that what's this bit that's sticking way up here that looks like another okay. support I think it's I, got a fan looking thing on the top. Yeah, yeah, that's where it would have attached, I think, to the flight deck. Uh. Or probably hangar deck. It might be this here. Yeah, uh, I didn't. See where, where it uh, just attached at the bottom there. Yeah, I think I'll have to. I'll get, a, I'll get him to pull us yeah. out a little bit further because I think I to think navigate we just have, that. This looks like it's by itself, though. Yeah. Like maybe once we clear this, we can. We'll need to be, come back in anyway. So do you want it? But do you want to go on the outside of it? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I'm gonna go on the outside of it, but yeah, I don't, I don't know, know if we want to pull further away, cause okay, you know, I mean, you're also lateraling still, so we may yeah. get pulled in a little. Yeah, I don't really know what that is. I mean, that looks kind of ventilation duct-like, but. It's two-toned, that's strange. We have our friend and fellow explorer ashore just bringing the nudibranch and uh, sea cucumber debate back to life, uh, who uh, thinks that it's most likely an undescribed species, the nudibranch that we saw, that beautiful purple one that so many people told me was a sea cucumber, but I so bravely <laughs> stood my ground. <laughs> oh. The lengths I have to go to around here. <laughs> I do enjoy your sea log entries, though. <laughs> <laughs> what is that thing here? Oh. I don't know, the hot tub kind of got me oh, over here. Oh, the hot tub. Well, when I labeled this most recent one, it was labeled, what is this thing? <laughs> I yeah. saw that. Yeah, well, yeah, so. you, you can go to great lengths because you're six foot eight. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's true. I'm just thinking whoever oh. goes back over these logs later is going to be a little confused until they see the video. <laughs> It'll it'll be me. So yeah. uh, okay. hopefully it'll make sense. I really it'll make sense. don't know what that is. I'm going to tag it again with I really don't know what that is. <laughs> Can we zoom in some? Sure thing. Wow. That's a pretty nice piece of bronze or whatever it is for yeah. a pillar support. Right. Well, those look like bearings there, though. They right? do. It's a gear. Yeah, like some kind of um, gear. It's, I was going to say there's a, there was a gun mount on the back, but it this is like on the like sticking overboard. 
Maybe it's bent overboard. Maybe. Wow. Fascinating. Just so an those are gear teeth on the yeah. inside there, yeah, right? Yeah. And then roller bearings. Yeah, and it got crushed a little bit. Hans, I would say that it's like part of this support, but I don't think it is. It doesn't really make sense. Some kind of crank well, or something rotated on there, yeah, like a crane base or Yeah. It could have been something internal in the hangar deck that you know, a crane or something that we can't I can't see in these external plans. Yeah. In some of these pictures, it looks like there's um, antennae things. I wonder if those can rotate to get better signal. I don't know. That's just looking at this picture. Hey, yeah. Can we zoom yep. back out? Coming up. Oh, what a beautiful yeah. haunting image. Mystery. Mm -hmm. I'm glad there are plenty of mysteries down here, things that we just don't know. We do have uh, some some thoughts or some opinions coming in from viewers that it's the base of the uh, forward, the, the port side forward 127 millimeter gun mount. I suppose it could be uh, if a lot of the rest of the structure around that uh, were ripped away, which is certainly possible. I'm not sure we're that far back though. Oh no, I see. Oh, if it's one of these. Yeah, I think they may be right. That is further forward than I was thinking. We've said it before. We'll say it again. We'd really appreciate all of you who have done so much research and are following along and contributing to the learning, to the knowledge. So um, we can't read all the comments that come in uh, out loud on air. They're, we're often we're often carrying on with other uh, important jokes mm -hmm. but uh, or sometimes operational maneuvers but uh, we do appreciate it it's c contributing it's it's going into the record uh, your knowledge is valuable to us right. so now we're clear of that we should do we want to continue on forward uh, Forward, backward. <laughs> Forward up the side. <laughs> Onward. Onward. Onward, backward. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Forward to the back. Yeah, that's interesting. It's, it's hard sometimes to look at these things because scale is deceptive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, is it a compass binnacle? Is it a gun tub support? It's, so if that's it's very a, large. If that's a gun mount, that's just the, the gun would be able to rotate on that large yeah. bearing and gear, yeah. and then yep. we could. Uh, interesting. Okay. And thank you yeah, to. That's actually, really good insight. Thank you to Catalina and Robert and Zach and Amber, masterfully mm. getting us the views we needed so that uh, our viewers could tune in and and uh, help us uh, help us on our way to understanding what we're looking at often. Mahalo front row. There's a lot of structure beneath us, Mike. Yeah. Almost like, you know, the, the waterline bulge is still framed out there. Hard to say at this distance. Yeah, it is. It looks like this deck is crumpled. Like it had been Oh, flat yeah, it's yeah, pushed so down, yeah. here, it like accordion this way. Right, okay. That brings us further out, yeah. But that's forward.
We have uh, just under an hour remaining before we're scheduled to uh, start making our ascent off the bottom. And we're um, trying to finish our uh, circumnavigation of the vessel, Kaga, Japanese aircraft carrier, currently um, just just back, just aft from the from the bow on the starboard. Oh, excuse me, port side, and um, making our way back to a midship where we began this exploration many hours ago. Yeah, 14 more, 18 hours ago. Yeah, they launched uh, approximately 1:30 uh, this morning. Uh, so we've been going for a while. Can we zoom yeah. on that? Yeah, can we get a zoom on this? All right. Uh, Amber, can we zoom in? Okay, go on in. Wow. Well, not sure what it is. Okay. Thank you. Universe. A lot of wreckage. Yeah, that's full yeah, wide. I feel, I feel like the deck's accordions there. Yeah. Like, like pushed forward? Yeah. I'm writing like these random notes on the uh, on the schematic of the ra of the ships, and I bet you, like in six months, I'm gonna have no idea what I meant. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> oh, I know. I, I can't read my own writing anyway. So. <laughs> well, you know what they say about doctors, right? Yeah. I'm, yeah. Well, I'm gonna like look at this arrow and look at accordion and just be like, what the heck? <laughs> I love accordion music. Yeah. <laughs> no, I do not. Oh. Yeah, my handwriting has objectively gotten worse the longer I've been in school. I can read it. Don't know about anybody else. <laughs> yeah, I can typically read it. If I'm in a class zone and I'm really scribbling, even I can't read it. Mm. Mm. Makes sense. Yeah. Or especially if I'm on the phone. Mm -mm. <laughs> nope. So we're basically looking at the inside of the boat deck, right? I, I think we're... I think we're uh, Can we zoom in again? more like over here, but maybe I think we're over here. Yeah. I'm not sure how far the boat deck went. How are we in terms of alignment with the edge of it? Are we we're, we're a little bit on top still, huh? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'll I'll get us out on an angle to try and get us off the side. Bridge now. Could 
Could we go one five meters at bearing one two five? Thank you. You know, you've been on the ship for a little while when uh, you're watching the heave on the camera going, I don't remember feeling any of those waves. <laughs> you're starting, uh, starting to get used to the gentle roll that's passing beneath, uh, beneath Nautilus here at the surface. How about when you don't uh, notice the camera's moving either? Yeah, oh yeah, Ooh, then, yeah. You're really, <laughs> then you're really, then you're really in it, yeah. It's, uh, I love that neuroplasticity. Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> My, one of my absolute favorite things is when you go on deck at night and you can see the stars and then you're looking and then all of a sudden you're like, whoa, the stars are moving, they're dancing. <laughs> and really it's just because your perspective of the stars is changing. It's pretty that. disorienting sometimes, isn't it? It's actually one of my favorite things. I first noticed it when I was working as a fisheries observer. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah, and uh, I just, it's something I pay attention to on every vessel I go on. I was uh, a little disoriented the other night, looking up uh, at all the stars, seeing the Milky Way, and, and uh, realizing that stars that are so easy to pick out when I'm at home in Honolulu, because they're you know, one of maybe only 100 in the night yeah. sky, when you put 2,000 stars in the night sky, all of a sudden, it's like, oh wait, which star is which? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's harder for me to remember. It's really amazing. Um, you know, people used to ask me when I was working on the fishing boats, you know, oh, the stars, they must be so amazing. It's like, actually, it's awful because we put out so much light pollution. Oh, yeah. Um, so it's yeah. so amazing, actually, to be a part here um, and going through the Papanamakua Kea Marine National Monument, they actually have, like, light restrictions. Oh, wow. And so we have, I think, like, the vessel is moving with a little bit less white light than it usually would and so it's you great. can see the milky way and it's absolutely amazing it's such uh you know my my own kids have been asking me if i've have i seen any you know sea life on the surface they want to know if there are dolphins or seeing sharks or seeing whales and we haven't seen many a few interesting pelagic fish but uh mostly the seabirds which of course are so impacted by that light pollution i know they are back home on oahu and uh yeah keep an eye out for flying fish too yeah, I have a seen a few. I actually yeah. saw a beautiful uh, a booby take a, take a malolo, a flying fish, right out of one of its leaps. Uh, it was right in the middle of the air. It was pretty awesome. Yep, that's a good point. If, if uh, some viewers or listeners haven't uh, heard that before, the light restrictions are for, you know, preservation, conservation of seabirds. That they'll be attracted to the lights, and we don't want to disrupt them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, yeah. Used to, that was a real issue when I worked elsewhere. Um, you would just have birds get disoriented and then they're just a whole bunch of birds on your deck. Um, and sometimes they have a really hard time getting back up and flying off. So I think it's really amazing that they've made this really, you know, they've really thought about 
the birds, which is well, for those, wonderful. I think yeah. any 137 uh, could attest to that. <laughs> I remember that story. <laughs> yeah. Oh wow. Well, you know, this uh, this is such a, such a more remarkable uh, marine national monument. The atolls here are literally home to millions upon millions upon millions of seabirds, multiple species, many of them dependent upon uh, these atolls as nesting sites. Um, you know, rest points of, of rest uh, for lives that are lived almost entirely in the air and at sea. Uh, so it's critical, critical habitat. Um, uh, but for wildlife that many of us would never see or never encounter, but call this open ocean, this vast Papahanao Mokuakea and, and Moana Nuiakea their home. And, and uh, those are elders um, here in Hawaii. We think of them as we think of our kopuna. Um, and uh, they are uh, so important to take care of. So I'm, I'm glad I didn't know about the restrictions on, on the lights on the boats. I think that's fantastic. I love that. Yeah. I know we were just speaking with uh, Malia Evans downstairs and we were talking about uh, Kilauea and Poliahu, our, our deity, our goddess um, on Mauna, Mauna, Lo Mauna, Mauna Kea. Kea. Mauna Kea. Yeah, Mauna yeah. Kea. our snow goddess. But, um, you know, she was just also saying that we see our deities or gods in natural phenomenon. So just that intrinsic relationship, um, they're here through those, those forms that we see. Just a good reminder. Such a beautiful part of the Hawaiian story that our, our ancestors can, can walk in so many mm -hmm. forms, swim, fly mm -hmm. in so many forms. Um, and, uh, and that all of us, mm -hmm. uh, as we progress from from Kanaka to Amokua to Akua, yeah. we, we go on that, that journey, a shape-shifting journey, mm -hmm. transforming journey. It's really beautiful. Mm -hmm. All right, real quick, I'm gonna get us to move another 15 meters in this uh, alongside direction. Mahalo, Katalina. Yeah, one of the things that reminds me of that uh, conflict between Mauna Loa and Mauna Kea uh, is driving the saddle road. <laughs> yeah. you, uh, as you get between Mauna Loa and Mauna Kea, uh, you see that Mauna Loa has much uh, younger, fresher lava flows than Mauna Kea does, and those have started to become overgrown. And the saddle road kind of follows that, uh, that surface boundary between the two for uh, a large, a uh, large portion of its uh, uh, distance. It does. Yeah. Watch those two powerful, imposing, uh, you know, representations of Akua uh, in a lot of ways on their own. Those two Mauna are sacred deities. Those who uh, pay attention to uh, indigenous politics or environmental conservation maybe have heard of the uh, some of the controversy, um, supposed mm -hmm. controversy over over what's, what should and, and what has and what will take place on Mauna Kea, uh, the world's tallest mountain from, from uh, bottom to top, from seafloor to, uh, mm -hmm. to summit, but uh, uh, also the sacred, a very sacred mountain um, to the Hawaiian people. And uh, yeah, it's just a fascinating to be in the presence of that mountain, and especially on that location on the saddle road when you're they're, they're on both of your shoulders. <laughs> it can yeah. be, uh, it's, you, you it's definitely very feel striking. it. You definitely feel it. It almost looks like textile. I know it's not. I think it's melted metal. Melted metal. Wow. Because in one of the bomb, yeah, two of the bomb, three of the bombs hit up here. It's seven. Oh, yep. no. Yeah. We're over here now. So, I mean, like, there were, there were bomb hits on the, Three of the bomb hits were in this uh, forward area. 